Good evening, my name is David Coleman. I'm the director of the Whitliffe Collections. I want to welcome you to our celebration of the exhibition Global Odyssey from Texas to the World and Back. Uh, we are very excited to have our panel of distinguished writers uh, with us here this evening. Uh, Stephanie Elizondo Grice, Manuel Luis Martinez, you guys are in the right order, this is good. <laughs> John Philip Santos, and our writer slash moderator, uh, Carmen Tafoya. Uh, before we begin, let me recognize a couple members of our audience uh, who are here with us this evening. We are always delighted to have members of the university administration uh, here with us, and we always appreciate uh, their support. Uh, the director of the university library, uh, the associate vice president, Joan Heath. Joan? And the library's uh, one of three uh, departments, I think that's the term, uh, that make up the Division of Information Technology, and we have uh, Dr. Van Wyatt, the Division's Vice President. Van. A couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, after tonight's program, uh, our authors have agreed, I think they've agreed, to do a book signing, and we're going to have them stay right here and have you all come up uh, to get books signed. If you've brought books or if you've already purchased them, that's great. Uh, as you probably saw, there are more books for sale uh, out in the lobby. And because we are recording tonight's event, I hope you can please turn off your cell phones uh, and just shut them all the way down. Uh, we've had technical issues when sometimes when the buzzers are set. Uh, so if you could just set it in airplane mode or just power all the way down, that would be great. Uh, let me get out of the way and let the program start. Just want to uh, bring in Steve Davis, our resident expert on literature from the Southwest, our curator of the Southwestern Writers Collection, and curator of the Marvelous Exhibition, so he can talk to you a little bit about the context of the exhibition and introduce more formally uh, tonight's speakers. Steve? Hello, it's good to see you all here. Thanks for coming out tonight. Got a few books I want to show you as I talk. Uh -huh. So I hope some of you had a chance to go in and take a look at the Global Odyssey exhibit we have in the Southwestern Writers Collection room. Uh, this is the focus of our common experience theme at Texas State this academic year. And uh, an exhibit like this was a lot of fun to do because we got to go in and explore the different ways that various Texas writers have interacted with the larger global community over the generations. And to illustrate a bit of how this exhibit works, I want to just share a couple of brief stories with you from it. One writer we focused on is Stephen Harrigan, who uh, grew up as kind of a casually mongrelized European who really had no particular sense of his ethnic identity. And at one point in his life, a few years ago, uh, Steve suddenly got interested in uh, when he remembered that the kolaches that his grandmother made were very distinctive and very unlike any other kolache he had ever tasted in Texas. And from that question, uh, Steve kind of embarked on an odyssey of his own, which eventually led him to the Czech Republic, a small village in the Czech Republic where he reunited with a long lost branch of his family, where he went to a bakery in the village and saw the kolache right there, took a bite and was instantly transported back to his grandmother's kitchen when he was five years old. Um, the story would be even more beautiful if the kolaches had tasted good. Um, <laughs> Steve himself uh, described them as threatening <laughs> and he has probably set the world record for losing the most kolache baking contests in Texas. <laughs> and we do have the grandmother's recipe on display as part of our exhibit for any of you brave enough to try that at home. <laughs> and one other writer I want to mention in this context too is Catherine Ann Porter. Um, like many writers from Texas we've seen uh, growing up here, uh, she was quite anxious to get the hell out of the state at the earliest possible opportunity. And um, she was a young woman in the 1920s and she wanted to go to Paris because that's where all the action was. 
Hemingway, Fitzgerald, Gertrude Stein, everybody was there and everything was happening. Um, but she wasn't able to afford the trip. Another affliction that uh, affects many writers, I think, during their careers. So Catherine Ann Porter went to Mexico instead. And it was there that she fell in with that great revolutionary group of artists, Diego Rivera, Frida Kahlo, the photographer Manuel Alvarez Bravo. And it was there in Mexico where Catherine Ann found her voice as a writer. And so that is a beautiful story. And speaking of recipes, we have her recipe for mole poblano, which uh, she shared with family and friends, and I think is a little safer if you decide to copy down and try that at home. And for those of you who did have a chance to see the exhibition, um, you probably noticed that the four writers we have assembled here are the stars of that show. And it's such a delight to have you all here this evening. And I'd like to do brief introductions for each writer so we can get on with our program. First up, we have Stephanie Elizondo Greist, who traveled uh, about 2,000 miles to be here this evening. Mm -hmm. Stephanie grew up in Corpus Christi. And uh, she was quite anxious to escape, I believe. Um, <laughs> she studied Russian at UT Austin, made her way to Moscow as a college student, was living in Russia uh, during the period where the Soviet Union had just kind of dissolved and society was in upheaval. And from there, she went to China and became a journalist for a year. Also had some adventures in Cuba, which she will deny if federal authorities ever questioned her. About. <laughs> <laughs> And for all of those uh, adventures kind of got wrapped up into her acclaimed first book, Around the Block. First book I'm going to show you tonight. Uh, this is for sale around the corner, courtesy of our university bookstore. For her second book, Mexican Enough, My Life Between the Borderlines, Stephanie uh, journeyed into Mexico to get a more solid sense, really, of her uh, identity as a person of biracial heritage growing up in Texas. And, not being as conversant in Spanish or even as uh, comfortable in the culture as, as she would like to be. And so that resulted in this second uh, beautiful book. Um, since then, Stephanie's become one of the major travel writers in America, or uh, would you say writers of place in a way? Is that mm -hmm. um, a way to describe that? Uh, she's been to 40 countries, has visited 49 of the 50 states, and I still don't know what you have against Kentucky. Is that the thing? <laughs> 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 it's, like Kentucky? it's actually Hawaii. Yeah, that's Hawaii. Okay, Everyone okay. wants to send me My that. Bad. <laughs> so Stephanie is currently a visiting professor at St. Lawrence University uh, on the Canadian border. And beginning in the fall, she's joining the University of North Carolina as a professor of creative writing. So please help me uh, welcome Stephanie uh, Elizondo Dice. And we are also very privileged to have Dr. Manuel Luis Martinez here. Manny is one of three writers on our panel who grew up in San Antonio. He attended St. Mary's University and went on to earn his PhD from Stanford. He is now a professor at The Ohio State University and the author of three highly acclaimed novels, including Drift, which is available. Um, Drift made several best of lists and I think I heard talk at one time there may be a film at some point. If which, I can star in it. <laughs> yeah, so he's holding out for, for that. Well, it's good to be a tough negotiator for yeah. those things. Um, another great novel Manny wrote is uh, Crossing, which is also for sale. Um, some of you may know that Manny uh, received the Dobie Paisano Fellowship uh, about a year and a half ago, which allowed him to live for four months at J. Frank Dobie's old ranch outside of Austin, where he has uh, been at work on a new novel, which we hope to see soon. And those of you who have uh, taken a look at the Global Odyssey exhibit, no doubt came across the photograph of Manny lounging quite comfortably uh, outside of a bookstore on the left bank in Paris. So be sure to take a look at that if you haven't seen it. Manny, we are so delighted to have you back in Texas. Thanks for coming. Thank you. We also have uh, John Philip Santos here. Uh, we're very grateful for his appearance. Uh, John Philip grew up in San Antonio and became the first Mexican American Rhodes Scholar. After graduation, uh, he became a quite successful documentary film producer based in New York. And in that capacity, uh, he traveled the world, uh, visited at least 16 countries, making films for CBS and PBS. And you'll see evidence of John Philip's travels in the exhibit, some great photographs, some cool Egyptian currency, a little notebook that he kept, 
Um, but even as he was kind of circling the globe, John Philip was tugged by um, his family in San Antonio, his heritage, and he was drawn back, uh, as many expatriates are at some point in their lives, I think, um, and began really a quest to uncover more about his family's heritage and history. And the result of that was this beautiful book, Places Left Unfinished at the Time of Creation, which was a finalist for the National Book Award. Um, not bad for a first book to be a finalist for the National Book Award. And if you don't have it, uh, this is your chance to pick it up. Um, I would say that since then, John Phillips authored two, two other very well-received books, Songs Older Than Any Singer, and The Farthest Home is an Empire of Fire. So if you get a chance, take a look at what the bookstore is offering tonight. You know, it's, uh, it's a great opportunity to get these books signed. And I will say, too, that John Philip is now rerouted in San Antonio as the University Distinguished Scholar in Mestizo Cultural Studies at UTSA. So John Philip, thanks so much for coming. And finally, we're finally, you'll finally be able to get on the program uh, real quick. Um, I'd like to welcome our moderator, Dr. Carmen Tafoya. Uh, this is at least the fourth and maybe the fifth time we've had Carmen here uh, for an event at the Whitliff Collections, which I hope gives some measure of uh, the high regard we hold her in. Um, Carmen grew up in San Antonio and has become a groundbreaking figure in Chicano literature. She's the author of more than 20 books. She's widely regarded as a role model and a mentor to other writers. She's been published in several languages, honored across the globe, has, uh, her work has appeared in more than 200 anthologies. If you can imagine uh, somebody who is that acclaimed, there she is. Um, <laughs> Carmen was recently honored uh, as the first ever poet laureate of San Antonio by Mayor Julian Castro. And uh, nobody who lives in San Antonio was surprised when that happened. And it was Alex Haley uh, among the people who praised Carmen, who described her as a world-class writer. And we, Certainly agree with that, and we're so delighted to have you here tonight, Carmen. Thanks so much. <laughs> Carmen's books, too. They're, they'll be there. All right. Well, I'm very excited to be at the same table with these people, and in the same room with all of you, we decided that <clears throat> we didn't want anything as stuffy as a bunch of papers and presentations and turns. We wanted to kind of have a rolling conversation. And so my job, as I see it, is to kind of toss questions out there that if, if we start to slow down in our rolling, just kind of get us rolling again. Uh, and your job as well, I would think, is to uh, add some of those areas of interest that we might not be addressing. And, and to bring up some questions at the end. We're going to start it off, and um, I'd like to start with what, for me, has become a very memorable part of international travel, and that is that you not only encounter the exotic, the unexpected, the very, very different, but you encounter the incredibly familiar. You encounter something that makes a connection with back home. So I'd like to ask us to start off by <clears throat> sharing experiences that are perhaps surprising cultural connections that we find while making global treks out from the sometimes green grass of Texas. Um, and, and I'll start off with, with one that surprised me because so much of my work is not just Texas, and it's not just San Antonio. It's West Side, San Antonio, Mexican American, low income barrio. It's very specific. And so a lot of the characters that I would perform on stage would be Mexican American, low income, West Side, Tex Mex, bilingual, bicultural characters. And there was one in particular called Tere, a young girl going into first grade that I used to perform that I was not surprised when I did it in Los Angeles or Tucson or the Rio Grande Valley or San Marcos and some young Mexican-American woman would come up to me afterwards and say, that was me, I was Tere. And I thought, well, maybe that is a pretty good portrayal of what it's like to be female and Mexican-American. And then I had to perform it in the north of Canada. There weren't any Mexican-Americans in the audience. And 
I thought, well, whatever, here it goes, and I performed it. And a young Latvian woman came up to me and said, that was me, I was Tere. And then I performed it in the north of Spain, and I thought, they don't know anything about Mexican-Americans. They're, they're you know, first-class citizens, you know, they're Spaniards in Spain. I mean, what do they know about being minorities? And a young Basque woman came up to me and said, esa fui yo, yo fui Tere. So I thought maybe that, that it was a pretty good portrayal of what it was like to be from a um, culturally non-dominant ethnic group and female. And then I performed it in Norway. And a young Norwegian man came up to me and said, that was me, I was Tere. <laughs> <laughs> what are those moments? What is it that hits you when you're someplace far from home and you find something that somehow connects. Does it ring any bells? Anything that brings you, brings you back or brings someone else into your Mexican-American kitchen or backyard? Shall I go? All right. So I would say um, the one that's actually coming to my mind uh, the strongest is actually one that I'm experiencing right now. So at the moment, I live in Canton, New York. Anyone knows where Canton, New York is? Canton, New York. You do? All right. Yes. <laughs> what? It, okay. Canton, New York is basically a suburb of Ottawa, Canada. Okay. It's, it is as far north as you can possibly get in the United States and still be in the United States. And um, I've become very intrigued. I'm actually writing a book right now about this, the, the U.S., Texas, Mexico borderland. So kind of like from Corpus Christi, the little triangle going down to, to Matamoros and Brownsville. So I've been, I've been studying that area for like seven years now. Um, and I'm finding incredible parallels with the Mohawk Nation, which is called Aquasesne, which is, um, they actually are bordering uh, uh, New York and Canada, part is in Ontario and part is in Quebec. And so um, I'm, I'm biracial, you know, I'm, I'm, half, I'm half Mexican, half Kansan, half of me is from Kansas. And um, what I have found very interesting about being from the borderland, it's just like kind of the perfect metaphor, right? I mean, being in the border, you're, you're, half, you're half here, half there. Um, but I'm finding this exact same thing in this area that I'm living now. And in the Mohawk Nation, I've become very close friends with a Cree man uh, who, who grew up a fur trapper um, in, in, you know, as, uh, as far north as you can possibly get in Canada. But he's a Métis, so he's half Native American, you know, he's half Cree and, and half white. And so just finding that sort of duality um, has been really, really wild. So we, we spend a lot of our time talking about borderlands, and he's like, yeah, it's really great to be from the border because, you know, you have a perfect excuse for having a split personality. <laughs> you know, you know, half of your world in this and half of your world in that. So I feel like I'm finding a lot of relationships, um, a, lot, a lot of connections that I've been able to make in that particular part of the world, which was very, very, very surprising to me. I, I, I'll just uh, st start out by saying that uh, you know, I grew up in San Antonio on the west side as well. We we're probably neighbors. Somebody, somebody. San Fernando Street? Yeah. 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 yeah, right well, there. Yeah. Barrio de la Tripa Gorda de la Flaca. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, I didn't go anywhere for a very long time. I'm, my parents were missionaries, so they, they took us. My earliest trip that I can remember was going to Mexico, Mexico City, and we lived there for about six months. I was about six years old, and I remember getting there, and for me, that was the beginning of the travel bug, you know, to, 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 to be in this new place, in this new city. I understood the language, because my grandparents spoke Spanish only to me, and so I spoke the language. But everything was different, and, and there was this sort of brimming excitement of, of connection, because these people looked sort of like me, and they spoke the same language, and yet not knowing anything about these people, because they did things differently. And I remember, uh, uh, you know, my mom trying to prepare me for going to Mexico and, you know, telling me, well, you know, we're going to Mexico and, and people are different there and, uh, and, and, and explaining to me what the differences were and me not understanding them at all. When I got there, the real connection to me was Batman because every kid in Mexico wanted to be Batman and I wanted to be Batman and they sold Batman masks on the sidewalk. <laughs> Like real Batman masks, not like the fake ones with the little, you know, like these were awesome <laughs> Batman masks. And I, I still have scars on my face, a couple of teeth marks from a, m one of my friends that I made in Mexico named Guti. And uh, Guti bit me in the face when I tried to steal his Batman mask. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know, and, and so <laughs> I can remember like sort of connecting to this idea that, that weirdly that this sort of like the media of it, like the, this idea of Batman that somehow it transferred over there, but they watched Batman in Spanish and, you know, and here I was in this country in which everything was unfamiliar and yet this was the sort of familiar space in which I was able to engage with the kids. You know, because when you're a kid, that's your society. You know, you get into with them, and and here we were, and we kind of would work around it, and uh, 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 and 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 I understood that I was somewhere different, and yet that I was somewhere familiar, mm -hmm. um, and and that was the beginning for me at a very young age of of understanding, traveling is, is is something special. You 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 find yourself and you lose yourself at the same time. And I didn't have words for it at that point, but I understood it. And, and that was the beginning for me of really, I think, wanting to become a writer. Mm -hmm. I mean, even I, don't, I didn't understand that, but that was the beginning of me understanding that I wanted, that leaving was in some ways returning, mm -hmm. and that I would learn new things, not just about the outside world, but about myself. And so that familiarity and that distancing and coming back and going forth backwards and forwards is, for me, the essence of writing itself. And, for me, everything goes back to those the, that first trip of this excitement of this mm -hmm. of this defamiliarization, and yet somehow learning about myself. Even at the age of five, you know, like already learning things. It's just a magical process. I'm curious. Did Batman have a different personality when he spoke Spanish? Because you know, sometimes you listen to TV and you're speaking a different language, and you're yeah. like. Oh, that's different from the way that person acts in the other language, you know. You know, we would strip, strip down to her underwear because, you know, Batman wore the yeah, little yeah. skivvies. <laughs> and, and we put on her black socks. And, you know, language was no barrier at that point. We <laughs> you know, put the towel on, mask on. We were Batman. And, and, cool. and that, so it was the international language of Batman. And, I, I, you know, cool. there's some things that just transcend all difference, you know. <laughs> Well, I was, um, you have to confess, uh, I mean, I'm honored to be on the panel with my beloved colleagues, my San Antonio brother and sister, um, and Stephanie, our South Texas compatriot. Um, but I have to confess, you know, that I, I really was very reticent about traveling. I come from a very sedentary um, ancestral lineage. Uh, you know, we've been around these lands since like the 1620s. We haven't moved around that much. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, we came to the northern part of New Spain and sort of uh, dug in from Cedalvo to San Antonio, out, out to the west a bit in Coahuila, up in the mountains in Musquis. Um, so I had a very sedentary hardwiring, genetic hardwiring. And, um, and so I was, it, it was kind of an ineluctable series of chance encounters that led me to, to journey outward. It was always sort of either um, benefactors like um, Cecil Rhodes or CBS News, or women, also women were very often um, either uh, calling me to come to some place, or once we were in some place, going to a more dangerous place. You know? uh, let's go into the revolution that's happening in Khartoum, or let's go into the Zapatista uh, uprising in Chiapas, or let's go into martial law in Peru, or, you know, so uh, benefactors and women sort of took me often on these paths into these places. Um, but what I would find when I would go to these places, no matter how remote they were, was uh, a point of contact and correspondence, something getting off the plane when I first arrived in Khartoum. I just had uh, an incredible sense of homecoming. I mean, the scent of jasmine, it was very hot, dusty. Um, sunset, you could see the Nile and the horizon, and I just felt like I was coming home. I mean, I don't know of any Sudanese lineage in the family, but um, maybe going back a couple thousand years, perhaps. Um, but uh, finding that you could be connected to places often way out from where your experiences lay. So. Uh, that's something that's mysterious that can happen wherever you go. Um, you know, I was going around in downtown Khartoum and there was suddenly a Santos Cafe. I thought, I really am home. So maybe there are even some <laughs> primos here that have started a Mexican restaurant. There were some, there were Portuguese cafeteros there. Um, 
But other places where you feel a point of contact that is very filial, um, and you know, experiences I had in Central America uh, making documentaries around the time of the Contra War in Nicaragua and seeing um, these battling parties um, on the border between Honduras and, and Nicaragua who looked exactly like the people I'd grown up with here in San Antonio and South Texas. You know, that we were part of this sprawling cultural polity that, that really went across borders, connected in these struggles of, of the poor against all of the oppressive forces set upon them. Um, and then a place like the Israeli-Palestine separation barrier, they call it, uh, engineered by the same people who are building the wall down on the U.S.-Mexico border. And, uh, and you find situations there that are exactly like what you see in Laredo, when people line up in Nuevo Laredo to come across for day work in Laredo. Um, so there are these um, implicit connections for all of us that, that really sprawl the globe, um, whether they connect to something that's mysterious, past life experience, deep ancestral genetic memory, or something that is very physical, something that you, you, you respond to because of the experiences you had here in South Texas, this great crossroads of cultures. You know, so uh, we think of South Texas as being, you know, we were often taught, maybe surreptitiously, uh, that, um, that this is a hinterlands. But it's often the very hinterlands that produce the new civilizational visions. And that was often what connected me to places all over the world, was the sense of coming from a land between cultures, this privilege that we have in South Texas, that, that this is a place that has hundreds and hundreds of years now of contact between people, strangers to each other. And that's all kind of in our genetic, literary, imaginary soup. And we bring that to any experience when we kind of disembark from whether it's a boat or a train or a plane or automobile. It makes sense to me. And uh, I think also one of the things that happens with our mixing, our cultural mixing, which is so ever-present in Texas, we feel it a lot. We feel the language mixture. But we look at other parts of the world and we find that that same kind of process is happening elsewhere. Languages are blending together. They're creating a new interlanguage. Uh, they're, they're moving forward. Even uh, in France, I just got back last week and um, um, <clears throat> in front of one of the magazine said, uh, uh, le new blue, le couleur de France. And, and the, le new blue, new blue is not French, it's English, folks, you know. And, and uh, direction au le car parc. You know, so the, the blending of the languages that was happening um, is a worldwide phenomenon. We absorb, we see what we're connected to, we see what's out there, we pick up what's out there, and Park is a great word. It's, it's much easier than the English, and, uh, excuse me, the Spanish and the French equivalents for it. So people pick it up, they use it, it's easy. A car park, you know, becomes universal. We've got probably 60, 70 countries here at this table of experiences. I want to know what's your favorite story? What's your most exciting story of something that happened far away from home? That's a tough one because they've all been exciting. Uh, start with number one. <laughs> uh, start with number one. I mean, the, 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 the first time I left, it's funny because, you know, growing up in San Antonio and growing up here on the, on the border, very close to the border, you know, going to Mexico becomes a kind of routine thing. It almost seems like it's, oh, you're just going, you're not really going anywhere, right? So my entire, my entire young adulthood, I, you know, it was interesting to bring up Catherine uh, Porter, because because of the idea that she couldn't travel to France, and so she sort of settled for Mexico, right? And she got this, and and uh, of course it was a, a pretty a good deal. Uh, she got a lot of material out of that. But but I remember uh, um, um, being really into the uh, beats uh, and and really uh, seeing uh, them because of the fact that they roamed around so much. And and my my desire was always uh, I I got to get to Europe. Um, 
that's a place where I, uh, where it all happens, and that's the center of it all. And not be, I was, I didn't leave the, the, the I didn't go overseas until I was 26. Uh, at that point, and and got there, and uh, got to England, and then traveled around a little bit, and went to France, and went to Spain, and went to these different countries, and really sort of being nonplussed, kind of waiting for the magic to happen in a way, and, and, and <coughs> recognizing that because we live in this kind of, uh, I, I probably couldn't have articulated it at that point, but because we live in this sort of global thing, you know, you get over there and you're like, gosh, it's not all that different than, than, than where I'm from. The only thing that is, is, is really changed here is maybe some of the language uh, and some of the sort of experiences, some of the people that I see, it's a little bit different. And then finding out that uh, really, I needed th that the that that the experience was was really going to be internal. Mm -hmm. It wasn't. It re really wasn't going to be about where I landed or or or, or the different scenery or the different uh, uh, monuments that you go and visit. It was really going to be about about. Tr there was this really interesting connection between going far away and the, the, the illusion in some ways that by traveling all over the place that you somehow uh, see the world and recognizing that really it was all about coming home in a way and understanding my home better than, and, because my home is myself, right? So, so it, was, it, was, it was going out and then recognizing, gosh, this is all about being able to step back where I'm from and finally begin to understand it, define it, understand what it means to me, understand why I long to go back there, and 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 you, you, it's really difficult to do that when you're right smack in the middle of it, and you're in the arms of your family and your friends and your culture, and so you have to go out. But it's not so much about seeing the outside world. Hey, that's great. I'm not knocking it, but it's really about being able to go. Geez, I want to get back there. I understand its value now. You know, I understand it as I get older and as I move around more. And to me, that is the 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 essence for me of of leaving because I want to come back. You know? <laughs> well I mean I think about it in terms of um, I mean in terms of any specific story, you know, the aspect of of storying your journeys. So mm -hmm. you know whether you think about journeying to find stories or you think about journeying as the unfolding of a story, uh, those are very different. So, you know, uh, those, the second one, the sort of the Graham Greene version of the journey without maps is more my style of journeying, which is that you set up um, a series of preparatory um, conventions that allow you to make a journey into some direction or other. And then, Things reveal themselves. Things emerge. Things are unexpectedly brought before you. Uh, and that, for me, is the magic of journeying. I mean, also for me, you know, the, the legacy of the beats, of, of Kerouac's voice, of journeying and discovery, um, and Gary Snyder as poet ally, you know, they gave me a sense of how to sort out what Herman Melville had sort of set up for us as a kind of uh, another version of journeying with a much more mystical and freighted set of conventions. Mm -hmm. um, and then my other two big influences in this would be Carlos Castaneda, that you can go into another version of the world when you're journeying. So not just the apparent world, but you can go into the extraordinary world, the inevident world. And that also kind of hooks back to Don Quixote. So, uh, so with those mentors in mind, you know, you would go into, for me, it became a process of, well, setting up these, these protocols to get out there and let things happen. So when I was writing Places Left Unfinished, you could still go to Mexico City, rent a VW for, you know, 120 bucks a week, and go off, and not really be concerned with being decapitated or uh, <laughs> bled out or something you just can't do now. So younger writers now, I think, confront that. You can't journey for discovery in Mexico with the freedom that I experienced. Um, 
So how do you then kind of sort out what is allowable in the way of letting these things take place? And I, I mentioned earlier, uh, on one occasion, this girlfriend and I, we had made some rather indulgent uh, preparations to go spend some time in Chiapas. Uh, we'd rented a beautiful place. We'd been very busy in New York for uh, some months, and we decided we were going to really indulge and get this place, beautiful setting. <laughs> It was New Year's of 1994, and so on the road, we're, we're driving down the Pacific coast from Puerto Vallarta to Chiapas, and the day before, we're to arrive in uh, San Cristobal. News on the radio that this band of militants have taken over the city we're going to, and we have to make a decision, well, do we go forward? And, you know, um, carrying laptops and she was very fond of jewels and various other kinds of accoutrements. And so, you know, well, we, drove into, we drove into the revolution. So, and that transformed the nature of that journey. And it was as if that was part of this preparation that we couldn't have expected. Um, and then I'll just tell you one last story, the, the most recent strange event, which was that in the more, more recent book, um, The Farthest Home is in an Empire Fire, which deals with my mom's family lineage and in the Texas Valley and the land that Stephanie was describing earlier, um, the kind of the golden triangle uh, between Corpus, Laredo, and Brownsville, Texas's Yaquin Tapafa County. Uh, if you all have not traveled there, you, you owe it to yourselves to go into the Texas Valley immersively one, one time in your life. Um, so that led me, the lineage of this family led me to Spain. And my mom's family had been part of the Escandon ex expeditions that founded many of the, the towns and villages of northern New Spain in the mid-18th century. So I was very involved in this family story in the Archivo de las Indias in Sevilla. And I go, I find the family comes from Asturias in the northern part of Spain. And I'm wandering around up there and there's an Archivo de las Indias, an old archive of the families that set out from Asturias, many who came to South Texas, what is now South Texas. And it was in a little village called Colombres, next to where my mother's family came from, Yanes. So I made this expedition to this little village, and I get to this town, there's one train a day that comes in, one train that goes out. So I know I have this one day of work in the archive, and I get out of the train very early that morning, and I discover that this town of Colombres is at the very top of this mountain. Uh, and it's just starting to rain prodigiously, like huge downpour of rain. So I'm getting soaked, I'm trudging up this mountain, and a car stops. And uh, the door flies open, and this old man says, you know, get in the car. Get in the car. And um, so I get in the car, and. He's saying, what are you doing out here in the rain? And so I'm going to the Archivo de las Indias. And, um, and he said, what are you doing at Archivo de las Indias? Nobody goes there. You know, it's like a, a curiosity here. We, we don't know what that place is about. I said, well, I'm researching my family. And they were part of the Escandon expeditions. And, and he says, I'm Escandon. You know, I'm Francisco Escandon. You know, this is my family you're talking about. So uh, those are these moments that you can't planned for. I mean, it then led, to, we went to his farm, he had all these family histories. Uh, you can't plan for these moments, and I call it inadvertentism, uh, that, that you only allow into the story what is inadvertent, what is unintended. Intention always brings some despoiling of the contents. Those things you just, they only happen when you allow them to happen. You often have to wait a long time, so publishers get very impatient. Mm -hmm. you know, like, <laughs> it's two years overdue, and you're saying, well, I'm, I'm waiting for something to happen. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, these something chance encounters. <laughs> John Philip, you opened a can of worms. Because I grew up in a San Antonio that was still influenced very much by the caste system, so that not so much inside the Hispanic community, but outside the Hispanic community, we were separated off by whether you were a nice Spanish boy or whether you were a dirty Mexican. And, you know, we still had that, that caste both. system going, you know. Um, and so people, if they wanted to be polite, would call you Spanish. Or, if necessary, Latin American. They would never call you Mexican. They would use that as a dirty word. 
Um, and so I was not about to claim what every third person on the block was claiming. Every time they wanted to seem a little pres more presentable, they would say, well, my grandmother was Española. She was a Spaniard, which you, we know that if everybody who said their grandmother was Spanish um, really was, that would mean that the minute any child, any female child hit the age of 13 in Spain, they had to deport her off to South Texas so she could be somebody's grandmother. It was impossible. It was physically impossible for all those people to be from Spain. But I had a grandmother from Spain, and I never claimed her. I never claimed her. I mean, it was terrible. I hid that part of my family because closet. I didn't want to, you know, I kept it in the closet exactly. And then there were these international um, conferences on Chicano language and literature going on in Spain, starting in about, I think, 1998. And, and I went to the first and the second and the third and I think the fourth. But when I went, I had, I, I went um, kind of thinking about Malaga, where my grandmother was from, and not really wanting to say anything to anybody, because of course I'm not going to claim to have a Spanish grandmother, but I, I um, you know, I, I'm talking to the airlines, and they said, you can return through Madrid, or you can return through Malaga, because that first conference, I think, was held in Granada, so we had to go through someplace else to get home, and I said, oh, definitely Malaga, and I said, is it possible to have a long layover, like, overnight? And they said, sure. So I had a setup to where I left the conference. I would be able to go back to Malaga, go to Malaga for the first time in my life, spend part of the afternoon, the night, and then fly out the next morning back to the United States. In the back of my head, of course, was the fact that my grandmother and I were very close. I knew all of her family names. I knew all of her nieces and nephews. I knew exactly you know, when she had left Spain in 1912, and you know, exactly what had gone on. And so I thought maybe I could get a phone book and look in the phone book and find one of these relatives. Mm -hmm. It was crazy, it was a crazy idea, but I thought maybe I'd do it. And since it was only gonna be light for a couple hours, I thought, well, I'll go take pictures. So the least I can take my elderly mother at home is some pictures of what Malaga looks like today. And I got this very fine taxi driver who, who took me all the way down. He said, no, I'll take you, you know, up the hill, and that way you'll be at a hotel. So all you have to do is walk down the hill, and it'll be easier on you. And, and I told him, well, see, it's that my grandfather and grandmother left Malaga in 1912. They left Malaga, and they never came home. Everybody <laughs> comes home to Malaga. How could they not come home to Malaga? Malaga is beautiful. Nobody doesn't come back to Malaga. And so he gets very emotionally involved. And so he's pointing out all these places. He said they would have gotten their passports right there. That was the old post office. This was a, he's pointing things out. I'm taking pictures. So I have all these pictures. So I've pleased my mother. I stick my camera back in my pocket. I, I you know, get to the bottom and walk back and see a few things. And then I get the phone book back in the hotel room and start making phone calls, not thinking anything's going to happen. And on the very second phone call, I hit the right house. Because in Spain, you have two last names. So I'm not just looking for Moreno, I'm looking for San Mian Moreno. And so, you know, the first one I try and talk the guy into being a relative, he quisiera ser pariente, <laughs> And the second one, I say, yo quiero hablar con el señor um, Angel San Mian Moreno. And there's a moment of silence, and he says, si. Sí? <laughs> ¿Quieres Angel el papá o Angel el hijo? And I go, well, quiero el Angel you know, que tiene un hermano que se llama Julio, que se murió hace como 15 años, 20 años, este ten, tenían una hermana también que se llamaba, and he says, Pepa. And I said, pues también ellos eran hijos de la señora uh, Concha, que tenía una hermana que se llamaba, and he says, Pepa, again. And I say, y esa Pepa era mi abuela, and pretty soon he's, están los parientes de América en el teléfono. <laughs> and so for 50 years of no contact between the families, my grandmother used to write them letters way back when, but 50 years of no contact, and all of a sudden they found the relatives, and I go, and my husband's all worried that I'm going off to, you know, I'm calling him long distance, saying, I found him, I found him, I'm going, and he says, now, wait a minute, leave your address that you're going to with the desk, okay, <laughs> just in case you disappear or something, that they're not who they say they are, and so I do, I leave my address 
that I'm going to at the desk, what I don't leave them is my numbers in Texas to call if, you know, <laughs> if I do disappear off the face of the earth. Anyway, they don't know who I am, they just know where I'm going. So um, I get there and I find the album with the letters and the pictures of my grandmother that she'd sent them back in the 30s and the 40s and all those years that they'd kept contact. So, but that was one of those stories you kept hidden. We were a traveling family and travel was always horrible. My mother said, no, you travel far, far away and you never get home again. And it had happened several times in the family. So, so there was a, an approach avoidance going with the whole issue of Spanish grandmothers. <laughs> yeah. That, 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 that really resonates. I, I went to Puerto Rico, my abuelito was from Ponce, and I had never been there. My mom's always wanted to go there, and you know, and he, he migrated in you know, 19, early 1920s and married my grandmother, and he was, he was always different because we were all Mexicans and he was Puerto Rican. Mm -hmm. And my abuelito was this really wonderful man, and he, he, he was a minister and he traveled, but, but he, he developed Parkinson's so he couldn't talk very well, but he had his different little trees that he would grow with mangoes and figs and plums and stuff like that that just didn't fit, and he didn't like the same foods we did. We just thought he was a little strange. And when I got old enough, I got the opportunity to go to Puerto Rico, and I was already, I don't know, in my early 30s, and I thought, I'm going to find Ponce. I was going to go to San Juan for a, a conference. I'm going to find Ponce, rent a car, and go and see where my abuelito was from and, and, and take some pictures from my mother who's in the audience and, and, and just see it and connect. And I drove with my now uh, partner, my wife, Molly, and we, we went across, and I got there, and it's sunset, you know, and there's the Caribbean. And it's so beautiful, and I'm going, gosh, connect, connect, connect. Belito, connect, I'm connecting with you, right? Let me feel something. And you know what I, what I felt, and I thought it was in some ways it was, is, in, in some ways it was more beautiful than a direct connection, was just the feeling of disconnection, the feeling of longing. Like I understood his longing, the absence of what he had missed, what he wanted what he would have loved to get back to. And, and, and to me, that is the most bittersweet feeling of traveling. In some ways, it's what I've become addicted to about traveling, and that is to get somewhere and to go connect, connect. You're somewhere different, exciting, and to just feel this sort of strange ocean of longing, not to necessarily get back, but just of being where you are at that moment and not, not being there at the same time. And, and for the first time, I felt connected to my abuelito, not because I was in his birthplace, but because I understood this feeling of profound displacement, of alienation, of kind of sadness. And I just thought, like, I could relate to that because I, as, as, a, as an adult, have had to do that. I've had to leave everyone I love the place that I grew up, the place that is me. And I have, I've spent my life as a, 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 in weird ways as an exile like him. And that was what I connected to. Mm. Absence, displacement, mm. this bittersweetness of, of the longingness, the love. That to me is the essence of love, the longingness to get mm. back. That something that is not, isn't something you can ever get back, you know? Yeah, my family is, um, on my mother's side, we're, we're Quineños, so we're from the King Ranch of South Texas, um, which is, um, you know, a, some, a, a, an aspect of my heritage that I'm incredibly proud of. And I was in, um, so when I was living in Moscow, well, actually, when I was, the year I lived in Beijing, um, I had a friend who was hardcore vegetarian who was living in Mongolia. So Mongolia, there are basically two substances that you can eat in Mongolia. Right? You got mutton and you've got flour, and everything is like a combination of those two. <laughs> There's actually like a, a famous like soup that they make where it's like they, they boil water and they get little dumps of flour, 
toss it in, it kind of like bubbles up and forms a little dumpling, then you put some salt and there you go, there's, you know, dumpling soup. <laughs> and then, you know, if it's a good year, you, you, t you toss in a chunk of mutton in it. So, uh, so I, would, I would go, I went to Mongolia many times while I was living in Beijing to do these like humanitarian food operations to my, to my hardcore vegetarian friend who had nothing to eat out there, uh, except flour and water. So, um, so on one of these trips, we decided to go out to the countryside. And, um, you know, Mongolia is a very horse-based culture. Um, they say they're more horse there's far more horses than people out there. And uh, we, we, you know, we rented some, some Jeeps, some Soviet-era Jeeps, and just went out to the grasslands. And we traveled for a couple of days. And we were going to the very, very center of the country to go on a, a horsebacking expedition. And um, the, you know, my, my friend spoke just a couple of words of Mongolian, but I, I speak Russian. And it turns out most people, most Mongolians over the age of maybe 50 also speak Russian because he was part of the, the Soviet Union. And uh, there was a relationship there. So I was telling him, um, you know, how I was from Texas. And he was like, and he's like, oh, Texas, cowboy, cowboy. And I was like, yes. I was like, my dad, yeah, cowboy. You know, my, my uncle over cowboy. And he's like, oh, cowboy, cowboy. He was so excited. <laughs> so when we get out there to, you know, we get out and there are these, you know, the horsemen are out there waiting for us. And, and it's, it's extraordinary. I mean, they're all five feet tall. The horses are like four feet tall. I mean, like really, really tiny little horses, <laughs> tiny little men. They have saddles that are made of wood, you know. So, I mean, talking pain, you cannot imagine. So, uh, so we get out there and um, so we're going to do like this long expedition on these horses. And um, there's this horse, like, so all the horses are, you know, just very placid little horses, and they're chewing their gum, whatever. <laughs> but then there's one, like, epileptic <laughs> horse. It's like having a seizure off in the grasslands. <laughs> and so my, the driver introduces me in a Mongolian to the, to the only Mongolian-speaking drivers, and I can, I can hear him say, you know, I heard, the, I heard the word Texas, and they look at me, Texas, cowboy, cowboy. So they bring the epileptic horse to me. They're like, she can handle, you know, the, the crazy horse. And I'm like... Yanni cowboy, dad, yeah, cowboy, Yanni cowboy. They're like Texas cowboy. So, you know, then there's like this moment, like you're Texan, you've got to, you've got to show up, you know. <laughs> you've got, you have a mantle to bring. So I get on this like the crazy horse, and we go, we go for. Um, I mean, it felt like we run for days. We're in this like Sherwood forest, you know, going on and on and on. And what's really extraordinary about Mongolia, they have this amazing, amazing, amazing hospitality, wherein if you pass by. Um, I, this is a part of the country where everyone lives in gares, um, which you might call a yurt. Um, they're, they're round, uh, round constructions, that they're, and they're, um, they're, they're really extraordinary. This little round, collapsible structure, and they throw felt, and they wrap felt around it and round and around, and they put a little wood-burning stove inside. And it's like perfect for the nomad on the go. You can like assemble it in half an hour, you know, disassemble it, um, put it on two horses, and, and you're off. So these are all nomadic pastures. And, um, but whenever you pass one, it's obligatory that you stop, and you have to, you know, you have to stop and you know tie up your horse and go inside, and the people that are there have to greet you, and um, and, and there's there's a ceremony that with which they greet you. They keep a, a piece of blue silk that's above their doorway just for guests, and so whenever we would stop to a place, they would take off the blue silk and come out, and um, if you're lucky they will give you a bowl of vodka. Like, it's literally a bowl of vodka. And they'll come out and they'll sing to you. They go, we're so glad you're here. You know? <laughs> but in Mongolian. And, and, then they, <laughs> and they bow you know, to you and they give you this ceremonial uh, you know, bottle of uh, the bowl of vodka. And you have to take it with both hands. And then there's this whole ceremony, like you dip your finger and you're like, you know, to the, to the, you know, it's the bless, bless all the sides and you bless your friend and you bless each other. And then you gotta, you just got to, down the entire <laughs> thing. And then you have to put it on top of your head to show you have drank all of the vodka to the very, very, very last drop. Yeah, and that's if you're lucky, okay? If you're lucky, you get vodka. If you're unlucky, you get fermented mare's milk. I cannot tell you. So when you're on a horse, you know, for four hours on a wooden saddle, like, a, you know, then to drink, you know, mare's milk. Which relaxes you. Which quicker. relaxes you. <laughs> yeah. so, so yeah, so anyway, when you said exciting story, that's sort of what came to mind. And then there's like the cross-cultural, you know, they were so excited that I'm from Texas, so like they have this understanding that I understand horses when I have like no understanding of horses. And then that they're all like, and then I'm like, oh, you know, I'm half Mexican. They're like, Mexican! And then they're like, tequila! Tequila! You can drink lots of vodka! <laughs> so, yeah. so you have to watch how you identify yourself, is what I learned from that experience. <laughs> but you know, the, uh, the other aspect of these you know, travels with these journeys that that we've been talking about in many cases, you know, they're, they're journeys of exploration or discovery, 
you know, where we have a certain kind of permission, you know, to go to a certain location, mm -hmm. a certain destination. Uh, but there's this other species of travel, which is forbidden travel, you know, when you travel to a forbidden place. Mm -hmm. So what happens when you elect as a destination some place that has been erased mm -hmm. from a map, you know, so, um, and what kinds of circumstances prevail on that kind of journey. Mm -hmm. It's the one, I think it's the one niche of travel themed uh, television, reality television that they haven't done yet. I mean, the, the various, you know, eating forbidden foods and strange foods, but, mm -hmm. you know, on, on one trip, one of the first trips I made uh, for places into Mexico, that, you know, I had the idea that I wanted to retrace the, the Cortes expedition, you know. Geography is destiny, geography is revenge, and you couldn't find a map. Nobody, and you would ask people, and it would make everyone very uncomfortable, the idea that you wanted to retrace the Cortes expedition, this disastrous, you know, uh, catastrophic um, cartographic line from Veracruz to Mexico mm -hmm. City. You know, and so I was in Mexico City for uh, a week or two just trying to find some resource that could really establish a reliable map for that. You know, and find it was more like one of these situations in a, in a bookstore where a guy said, Psst, yeah, yeah. check out this book. You know, this mm -hmm. is the Itinerario de Hernán mm -hmm. Cortés. And mm -hmm. so you find then you know, a resource and you go into the, another version of the kind of open journey, the journey without maps here where you've got a kind of secret map. Mm -hmm you find scant evidence of, of this journey, but places where the evidence still exists. A broken wall in Tlaxcalteca, mm -hmm. and, you know, and it's, it goes to what people want to remember. So uh, Mexicans don't want to remember that. Uh, around the same time, Carlos Fuentes was extolling the idea of putting up a, a statue of Hernán Cortés in, in Mexico City and, and drawing a lot of fire for it. You know, but journeying can discover these roots with your families or points of correspondence with others, but also these things that are uncomfortable to remember. You know, these places that take you to something dark about ourselves, our shared humanity, um, you know, um, traveling into Northern Ireland during um, the, the summer of the hunger strike. You know, I was leaving Oxford and, you know, people said, well, you're going to Ireland, you're going to go to Dublin, you're going to the... Twelve Bends in Kilkenny, and I said, "No, I'm going to go into Belfast. I'm going to go to um, Northern Ireland." And it was as if, you know, I was taking this forbidden path. Mm -hmm. So those also have a role to play. Going to the place that is, you know, in a sense, excised or erased or problematized. Traveling right now in the West Bank is very similar. If you if you want to make a trip um, mm -hmm. into occupied territories, into ter territories that are in dispute. The Texas-Mexico border is a, another good example. Um, you know, there is a place for that too in our stories, how we make our journeys and what we draw from them. It reminds me of a story of a couple of friends of ours, the Jewish friends that had decided to go to the Mideast. They started with Jerusalem, but then they started traveling around. And one of the worst evenings they had was an evening when it got a little late on them. The sun was going down. It was almost Sabbath. She had a short-sleeved T-shirt, which she thought was non-controversial. It said, peace. And she got the dirtiest looks everywhere they went when they would see the word on them because it had a different symbolism. Mm -hmm. Who are you? If you say peace, you mean you're going to make the treaty go your way. Your peace means an end yeah. to us. Mm -hmm. And so here was the word peace be mm -hmm. one of the most mm -hmm. dangerous, <laughs> controversial things she could have worn on a t-shirt and she didn't realize it. So. It's, it's yeah. fun, it, if on the flip side of that, in 2008, my wife and I went to Paris and we had worked really hard on the Obama campaign. And so we were sporting our Obama t-shirts the whole time where there were like a big collection of them. And we were treated so well every time we went somewhere. <laughs> Obama, Obama. I was like, wow, hey, it's a great time to be in Paris. They were in love, <laughs> in love with Americans yes. that, uh, that year. Um, but you know, you're, you're, you're talking about the forbidden places. Just to really quickly, what I have learned really because I've spent enough time traveling outside the US and in the US is that for me that 
as I get older, the more interesting forbidden places are right here in the United States. Like I've spent so much time in the last four or five years recognizing, you know, working with uh, migrant kids in colonias and in places that you're not supposed to go or that you're supposed to ignore or that are supposed to be invisible. I mean, there are forbidden places right here in San Marcos. There are forbidden places in San Antonio. There are forbidden places in Austin, whether they're under the bridges or they're on the wrong side of town or they are places where we are told, I'm living in Chicago right now. That is a, a mystifying place to me because I live in Lincoln Park, which is nice. But if you go four blocks over, it's not nice. And if you go over here and don't go here and don't go there, and I'm and it's 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 crazy to me that that you're that you're supposed to negotiate this stuff, and that these borders and these danger zones are right here, and we don't even understand our own cities. We don't understand our own geographies, and and, and we're divided amongst each other it, it, it's it's a uh, it's it's maddening i find as i travel to other places i find that that, that they really that the idea of borders and separation and differences they don't have to go anywhere they're right here you know they're right here you know i mean the places i'm afraid to go why am i afraid to go there i go back home sometimes and i go you know uh, uh, my mom lives very close to the west side i still go there and I find myself sometimes going, eh, you know, like sketchy, <laughs> sketchy. Going, what's happened to me? You know, uh, why are these places right here forbidden? You know, I mean, and, and talking about that 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 connection to the outside world and the inside world and our localities. I go, you know, those divisions. You don't have to travel that far out to start to. There's to a Gonzo, you know, the, the Gonzo spirit, the, the so-called. You know, Gonzo mm -hmm. journalism, the orientation where you go into those places. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. I mean, and, and we've probably all met people who do this. I mean, who do this for a living. And when you encounter them in some distant part of the world, you think, I got to get out of here. Something, <laughs> if they're here, I've got to get out of here. here. Uh, <laughs> there was a group of people I would see in these various places, you know, uh, coups, wars, revolutions were in the offing, and you knew, I mean, that was not what I was there for, um, but some people elect to do that. You know, um, our, our um, uh, Texas, now Arizona-based writer, um, Charles Bowden, mm -hmm. um, you know, so I choose not to be around uh, gunfire or bombs. I mean, I've often been around them, but unexpectedly, you know, and, and I try to get out as quickly as possible, but another kind of journalist, another kind of writer, another kind of traveler goes to those places, and I give them many props, you know, just in terms of their, their courage, their willingness to be at risk, um, you know, if you drive three hours south from where we are today, you're in that world right now, uh, unfortunately, if you, if you, you know, want to go to Tamaulipas, if you want to go to Coahuila, if you want to go have lunch in Piedras Negras, um, you're in that world again. Um, so it pops up, you know, these are places that growing up, at least, you know, in my time, were very safe. You know, North Mexico was uniquely safe of all places in, in, in Mexico, and, and most of Mexico was safe. Um, but now it's part of this territory that kind of traverses the globe, these zones that you go into at some risk. Um, and I always wonder about the people who want to do that, you know. Um, I mean, I saw them most often, they were uh, videographers, so camera crews, you know. And, uh, and they were camera crews that specialized in what they call the bang bang, you know. And, uh, and they were the ones who, if you saw them around you, you knew you were in a bad place. Uh, whether, in my case, it was Khartoum and Chiapas and Peru and Nicaragua. Um, I was there for other reasons, looking for something that I thought was kind of underlying things that were taking place, underlying the war, underlying a revolution. Uh, but there's some people who are there for that sense of action, the sense of danger. Um, my ancestral, that kind of sedentary ancestral uh, spirit that I talked about earlier, always tells me to get out of those places as quickly as possible. The unfortunate thing is that sometimes you're in those places and you can't get out. I mean, 
whether it's New York City in the days after 911, or um, Khartoum after a coup, or um, and then you have to really sort out what your role is and and what is being revealed to you as a writer, as a filmmaker. Um, Stephanie, you were in Russia as the Soviet Union was unraveling as an American. Mm -hmm. And everybody knew you were an American. How did they respond to that? Wow, that, that immediately brings up one anecdote. Um, so I'd been there for maybe two and a half, three weeks. And I had befriended, at the time I was a student at UT Austin, and I befriended a Russian exchange student while she was studying in Austin. And so she wanted me to come out and visit her as soon as I got to Russia. She lived in a city called Lijinovgorod, which would entail like a six hour um, train ride. And so uh, the way, the, way the, the Moscow metro system works, um, they have these really extraordinary escalators. And when you're, when you're at the top of them, you feel literally like you're descending into hell. I mean, it's like <laughs> there's, they go so deep into the earth. And when you're halfway down, you cannot see you know, where you came from or where you're going. I mean, you just you go deep, 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 deep into the bowels of the earth. And, um, and there's a little babushka, a little grandmother um, who's in her little metro uniform. And she sits in the, there's a little box um, at the very bottom. And she just sits there and, and she's like, She's like, you know, sit, you know, stand to the left, stand to the left, stand to the left. So she just basically like, yells at the people about, you know, proper etiquette behavior on the escalator. And uh, there's a big button. And so if she doesn't like what's going on, she'll press the button and then it'll, you know, it'll stop and people will like half fall off. She's like, I told you, move it, you know. So, so she's directing traffic from her little box. So anyway, so I get to the bottom and, um, and I'm, I'm disoriented and I have my train ticket. My train's going to leave very soon. So I'm like, I don't know where I'm going. And so I knock on the little box. I'm like, who better to ask but, you know, this woman who's completely in charge. And I was like, no, извините, пожалуйста, но я не знаю, где я, Нижний Новгород, там и там. Like, where is, where, how do I get to Nizhny Novgorod? This way or this way? And she looks at me and she goes, откуда ты? Where are you from? And I was like, ну, я из Техаса. Like, I'm from Texas. And she's like, ты американка? I was like, ну, да. Ты американка? Да, американка. Ты американка? This way or this way. <laughs> and she gets out of her little box and she grabs me. Um, and she's she's very she's a very you know small woman, so she can only reach to my shoulders, but she's aiming for my neck. And she grabs me and she begins to shake me. And she goes, Americanka, it's see that seal that American, get out of here. And so she just starts, you know, screaming and shaking me. And um, and I, I I have I mean all I'm trying to do is I decide which way to turn, and she's you know, and, and it, was, it was an extraordinary moment because, you know, it's 1996, the Soviet Union has collapsed five years prior. This woman has seen all of her life savings dissolve overnight. This woman has seen this ideology that she'd probably work for her entire life or, you know, that her parents had worked for, something that she completely bought in, now into dust. And, and she sees me as the symbol of all of this hardship. Um, and I'm at the moment also seeing her the source of, you know, all of my heart. <laughs> you, know, you know, Moscow, it was, it was a really, really, really difficult time to be living there. It was, you know, anyway, so we're both suddenly taking our anger out on one another, um, what our respective countries have done to one another. You know, me for this, like, you know, very stressful, you know, period of my life and her, like this, you know, incredibly, like, long generational period of her life. And so I find myself, like, putting my arms <laughs> around her. And also, to, so we're both suddenly, like, struggling with one another and yelling at each other. Um, she's yelling at me in Russian. I'm yelling at her in English. And we're like... Ah, you know, <laughs> just sort of getting it out, and then and then it's but it but it fade. it's like this moment of intensity, and then and you know at one point she's kind of like kicking my legs, and then and then she just because <laughs> she's she's not having much success with my neck, and then and then she just drops and I drop and we're exhausted, and she goes Nizhny Novgorod, what the? And I was like, no spasiba, and I take my luggage and I just walk yeah. away, and um, you know, just passing the night. And, anyway, that's what Moscow was like in 1996. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like the Cold War. Like yeah. a yes. microcosm of it. Yeah. <laughs> Manny, I get the feeling you became more Texan and more you the more you traveled elsewhere. Uh, uh, definitely. I, I, I don't think I knew I was Mexican until I left. Uh, <laughs> San Antonio. Yeah. I just didn't. I mean, I yeah. grew up speaking Spanish. My grandparents were Mexican. They, I, I didn't speak English until I went to school. Um, 
And it just, I grew up on the west side. I went to Edgewood Elementary. Uh, I just didn't, it wasn't something you ever thought about. Um, and then I left to uh, Ohio when I was uh, 22, <laughs> Columbus, Ohio. I had gotten a full scholarship there to study creative writing. And my parents, this is a time when you could still go to the airport and, and see people off. And my entire family came, 22 of them. And everybody's weeping and crying and gnashing of teeth. No one's ever left home. I'm the first college student. And I'm crying. And they're crying. And everybody's crying. And we get on the airport. And I'm still crying. I'm getting the airplane. I'm still crying. I didn't, I'd never been on an airplane. And so I sat down in first class. I didn't even know you sat down, so where I was sitting there going, ah, and this, the, you know, the the, per, the flight attendant felt sorry for me because I was sitting there crying, and, uh, and so she didn't even move me. She was like, you can sit in first class, and they brought me a couple of drinks. I thought, wow, flying is pretty awesome, man. I just sit here and cry and drink gin and tonic, and then I, I got to Columbus, and they they, you know, I took the, 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 the taxi, I got in about midnight, and they took me to the dorm, and it was this 18-story dorm, and I had never seen anything like that before, and, and I got in there, and there were these, they were like, uh, you know, it was maybe, I guess, it was about midnight, and there were all these Asian people playing ping pong at the, at the table, and I was like, I'd, I'd seen Asian people, but I didn't really know them all that well, and these were like Asian people, like from Asia, like China, and Korea. They put me in the international dorm because my name was Martinez, you know, and they're <laughs> like, this guy's obviously, he's foreign, let's put him in with the uh, Asian folk, and you know, I was the only Mexican in Columbus, and, uh, and, and I got there, and I, 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 uh, um, Immediately, people didn't know what to do with me. People would ask. I had one girl that I was talking to at a party, and I was getting friendly with, and I was like, hey, this is working out pretty good. And she said, hey, can I ask you a really personal question? And I was like, yeah, sure. She said, are you Latino? And I was like, I, was like, I guess so. I don't know. You know, the, the first pizza delivery I, I ever got, because I didn't want to go outside. It was too damn cold. And, and, and I'd never seen snow before, and it was freezing, you know, it was white snow everywhere. The people were white, the snow was white, the buildings were white. I was like, where am I? And, and I ordered a pizza, and the guy goes, I have a pizza here for Martin's, Martin's, uh, I was like, dude, you don't have any vowels in your name. You're like Polish guy, and you can't pronounce Martinez. Like, I, 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 and and it, it, was, it was a crazy time that I, I had to leave um, where I was from to recognize what it was that I was leaving. And it was that time that, I, you know, I got to be an expert at judging the weather by touching the window. I'd get up in the morning, I'd go touch the window, I'd go, oh, I ain't going anywhere today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm staying home. <laughs> this is too cold for this Mexican to go running around in the snow, falling all over the place. These white people love the snow. I remember getting there, and the, the, the secretaries in the department would be like, ah, oh, yeah, I'd be like, oh, my God, it's so cold outside. And they'd be like, has, winter hasn't even started. And I'd be like, F you, man. I'm like, I'm from, uh, this is horrible. And they're like, it hasn't even started yet, man. There's still three months of it to go. And I was like, ah, I want to kill myself. But it did. I, I spent a lot of time uh, realizing what, what it meant to be Mexican, but I couldn't realize it at home. It was just, it, I had to leave, I had to encounter being different. And that's kind of weird to, to say that, but I, you know, I've had a lot of friends who have told me, ah, oh, when I left, when I left, you're going to Ohio, where the hell's Ohio? That's horrible, you're gonna, you're gonna hate it, you're gonna hate it, and I did hate it. <laughs> but um, I wouldn't be where I am today if I hadn't left. And that's something I learned, you know, my grandmother died when I was 16, she was a big influence in my life. And, and, but she'd grown up as a migrant worker, and she had had to make the tr trip north. And when my dad came from my graduation, he flew up to Columbus, and, 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 and we were driving around the countryside, uh, or whatever, the farm areas, and he was like, we were here, we were here. Oh yeah, I remember this camp here. I remember that camp there. And it became real to me, and I thought, you know, we, we, we have been, tr the whole history of my family is traveling and moving around. And, and, and in a weird way, I suddenly felt connected to the history of my grandparents. My grandmother never let me forget she'd been a migrant worker, and she'd been through the Great Depression, and she'd been through poverty and all this stuff. And to me, I was a kid, you know, there's stories, oh, grandma, you know, you know, whatever, the stories. And now here I was, definitely not in the same position of being a migrant worker, but now being in the position of feeling like the outsider and feeling like, 
oh my gosh, I gotta come to terms with being different, with, with my identity. And um, that was the first time that it became real to me, that, I, that there was difference, but that that difference was beneficial, that that difference was, meant the world to me, that, that, that I wanted to explore that difference. It wasn't something that was gonna hold me back. So when I came back and friends were like, oh, horrible, right? And I was like, yeah, it was hard, kind of, but man, you gotta get out of San Antonio, buddy. You know, you gotta go see something, you know? And, and, and for Mexicanos, I think for so many of the, my friends and relatives, you know, we just stayed there, you know? We stayed home and didn't go places and, uh, and it's, it has made all the difference. And you know, I remembered my grandmother's stories when I had to go off, and I remembered her, her story, and I thought, you know, if she could have done that, she could do that, I could do this. And that helped me through the rest of, I mean, it still helps me now. Whenever I start to go, gosh, that's gonna be hard. And like, oh, uh, wait, grandma would tell me to shut up, get out of bed, and get moving. And, and she did it. I can do it, you know? And so the, 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 the mobility, the movement, the desire to push out, even though there are scary things out there, you, you can't, that's to me the essence of travel. You, you, you can go everywhere you want in different places, but you're with yourself in the end. And it's you at night, and it's you on your own, and you have to figure it out. And you come to terms with yourself. And it's, it's, it's a, there's nothing else that replaces that knowledge. Are there questions that you would like to ask us to address? Um, yay, that's, a, that's an amazing question. Thank you for asking. How my journey began, um, I was a senior in high school, and I somehow got an invitation to a journalism convention in Washington, D.C. To this day, I don't know how, I, I, I think maybe it was an editor of the yearbook or something, but um, you know, I get it, and I read, I read you know, it was an incredible conference. It was sponsored by the Washington Press Club, and um, you know, there were gonna be editors from Time Magazine, Newsweek, Washington Post, um, Reverend Jesse Jackson was going to be there. You know, this is very exciting for me uh, to, to get this invitation, but I was like, oh, it's $500, I can't go. You know, so I kind of toss it in the drawer. And um, then maybe a month or so later, I'm, I'm cleaning out a drawer, I see it, and for some reason, I just have this, like, this almost premonition. I'm like, I need to go to this conference. So I go to my mom, I'm like, mom, conference, you know, <laughs> and she's like, I, you know, and she, uh, she ends up making me an offer. She says, if you can raise the money, um, I'll give you frequent flyer miles to go. So I ended up, you know, anyway, so it's, it's this long journey of like, you know, okay, I need to go. So who am I going to ask? I end up going to this, you know, a law office, all these Latino lawyers, and I go from one to the next to the next to the next. And I'm like, oh, you know, I really want to be a journalist. You know, this, this conference will show me how. And they're like, okay, Miha, here you go, 50 bucks, you know. So, so, you know, so I went around, you know, really worked La Raza angle, which is amazing. And La Raza really, you know, came through for me. And so the whole community of Corpus Christi, like, sent me to this, this conference in Washington, D.C. And the keynote address opening night was given by Charles Beerbuyer who was a political correspondent for CNN. And he gets up and tells the most extraordinary stories I'd ever heard. Um, he'd seen the collapse of the Soviet Union, the fall of the Berlin Wall, you know, riots and revolution and coup d'etat. And the entire time he was talking, I was just thinking, wow, you know, the only thing people will get out in the street and shake their fist about in South Texas <laughs> is football. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I want to go where this man has been. So he just tells these really exciting stories. So, so when he was done with this amazing oratory, he looks down to the audience and says, all right, who's got a question for me? And I you know, ran to the front of the room and grabbed the microphone and I said, I have a question. I want to be you. What do I do? And he looked at me and he said, learn Russian. Next question. And I was like, hey, you know? I was, like, I was like, I'm Mexican and I can't even speak, you know, it's my abuelita. Like, I can't even, I don't even know Spanish, you know, how am I, I have to learn Russian? 
you know, and this was like 1992, right? My only associations with Russia was like, you know, the Cold War, communism, cold weather. Why would I want to go there? There was the evil empire. Um, but, you know, being, I was, what, 17, 18 years old, and I was old enough to recognize that, you know, most people, when they give you life advice, they say these very, you know, things that sound really beautiful, but they're not concrete, like, pursue your dreams, and, you know, you can do whatever you want to do, and da-da-da. So I begin, I begin a lot of those kind of motivational speeches. But this man was like, learn Russian. Go. Yeah. You know, <laughs> next question. So I was like, all right. So that's really what began the journey for me. Um, I had, I, there's no way I would have studied Russian, but this man told me to, and I was like, okay, that's, that's, that's specific. <laughs> so when I went to UT, I mean, I knew I was in trouble the very first day the professor walks in and says hello to us. Is anyone out here say hello in Russian? Здравствуйте, да. But how do you say it in Spanish? Hola, right? Four, four letters, yeah, okay. Здравствуйте and hola. Anyways, I was like, I am so done for, but I stuck with it <laughs> for four years. So that's really how the journey began. It was just something very offhanded that someone said. And, and I think that, I mean, I took him very literally, learn Russian. Okay, I will learn Russian. Yes, going for it. But I think he just meant do something, do something, do something out of the ordinary, do something unexpected, and, and don't, don't feel limited by anything. And that, that's, that's, that, that, that little voice has just stuck with me now, you know, all of these years that I've been traveling. Um, and I, something else I want to say, you know, um, I, I was always under the impression that one had to come from means to travel, and I've actually found just the opposite. I feel like not having a lot of means um, it makes you very resourceful, and um, there are a lot of there are a lot of scholarship opportunities um, for for people that don't don't come from you know from great great luxury. <coughs> um, so so yeah, if you want to travel, it's it's just it's just the desire. And, and the pursuing of the desire. Um, so don't let anything hold you back in that regard. You know, you really, you really can go for it. And um, I mean, I'm really living proof, and I'd be happy to talk with you afterward. You know, I've, 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 I've kind of become like a professional grant writer for like my own little self, you know, I'm like the corporation of Stephanie Elizondo Grice. I'm like, <laughs> I mean, it was like, you know, all, of, all the countries I've been to, I've been to on someone else's dime um, for the most part, you know, through, through writing and through travel grants and things like that. So yeah, go for it, go for it if that's what you're, if you're feeling yourself being called. That is the best way to travel. Mm -hmm. And someone else is dying. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I mentioned earlier that you know, m much of my um, uh, journey into the world has been because of women. And um, you know, uh, when I was a senior at Notre Dame, um, this philosophy professor named Sheila Brennan. Um, said to me, you know, what are you, what are you planning to do after um, graduating? And I was at the, really at the apex of my Tex-Mex nationalism at that point. I was, I was uh, committed to the idea that I was incensed that Chris Strockwitz, a German immigrant, had come in and mapped and recorded and assembled and anthologized Tex-Mex music. And I wanted to come back to Texas and, and work in that region around kind of border balladry. And, and she said, you're gonna go. You're gonna get a Rhodes scholarship. You're gonna go to Oxford. You're not going back to Texas right now. And I thought yeah, I'd never heard of a Rhodes scholarship. I thought it was a R O A D scholarship, <laughs> which sounded very good. Uh, and that's how that began. But you mentioned, you know, when you get to these places, how do you feel? You know, coming from San Antonio, coming from the world that we grew up in, um, I never felt. Uh, I never felt a part of an excluded people. I never felt a part of an oppressed people. I, I felt a part of an ancient tradition. So I knew what this was about in Oxford. I said, you got an ancient tradition, I've got an ancient tradition. You call me Santos, you think I'm Greek or something, but uh, I've got another story. You know, it's an ancient Mexican story. It connects to the indigenous world. It connects to Iberia. And there began you know, a dialogue with that, with that world. You know? and, and then at a certain point, come back to San Antonio and, uh, and was settling in for another kind of Tex-Mex uh, trance spell at work writing for the newspaper in San Antonio. And another woman, a, a woman who was an executive producer from CBS News, we met at some point. I was make, trying to make a film about Tex, Texas ancestry. And she said, well, come make that film you know, for, for us. And so that took me to New York. And so you know, there have been these spells where I was kind of coming back to San Antonio, settling back in, and then I would go off again. And, and that one lasted 22 years, you know, and, um, 
And at a certain point, I was realizing, well, I'm writing about this world down here. And I'm freezing my ass off in Berlin. Uh, I'm, in, I'm in a frozen cabin in Yaddo in upstate New York. There's something wrong with this picture. You know, I, mean, I continue to be obsessed with these stories in this world. And that's when I decided to move back. Uh, in 2005, you know, so kind of well into my story, you know, but I think coming from the world that we come from in South Texas, it, it's possible to go out to anywhere in the world and have a sense of not only being open to their stories, but that you have a story that you're bringing from Mission or from, where did you say you were from? Brownsville. Brownsville. I mean, uh, you know, these are, these are uh, places that the world is waiting to hear from right now. You know, Brother Domingo Martinez, who just was a uh, finalist mm -hmm. um, for the National Book Award for his Boy Kings of Texas. I don't know if you, uh, they, they, the National Book Awards uh, uh, evening, the awards evening, the chair of, of the national, of the nonfiction uh, panel was giving the award and he took this very unusual tack, which was that he, rather than just announcing the winner, he decided to, Describe the book that had won. Um, and he started describing, this is a book about a place between worlds. And so that eliminated two or three of the books from the list, but not Domingo's book. And this is a place uh, that deals with the people uh, whose stories have been neglected by all of us. And that maybe eliminated one or two other books. And it turned out to be a book about the Mumbai slums, but it was Interesting that, you know, well into this guy's decision to describe the book rather than name the winner, that this story was still part of what could be either Mumbai, Brownsville, mm -hmm. Nairobi, mm -hmm. etc. You know, so um, maybe, you know, there's been a tendency for some of us to internalize the sense that we come from a land of mm -hmm. the, you know, hinterworlds, um, when in fact this is the world that needs to speak now. Um, to onward with that. You know, uh, uh, running, I, running so strong in, yeah. in what Manny keeps saying about, you know, the, the most alien places right here, the place we have to discover is here, and what John Philip is saying is, you know, it's all, all here, and Stephanie's talking about, about, you know, comfort zones and, and moving out of those comfort zones. It, it seems like it's all running on the same parallel that we carry inside ourselves that which is familiar and that which is exotic. So when I think about, you know, moving far, far away to a, a whole different point in my life, moving out of my comfort zone, I'm talking about going off to college 45 minutes away from where I grew up because I grew up in San Antonio. And I grew up in San Antonio, where San Antonio is very Mexican-American. I don't care what side of town you live on, you can't <laughs> escape Mexican-American. If you live in the white side of town, you get a lot of whites and high income and a lot of Mexican-Americans. And if you live in the middle class, you get the Mexican-American in the middle class. If you live on the poor side of town, you get the Mexican-American <laughs> poor side of town. But it's just a very Mexican-American community. It's kind of integrated through everything despite the ongoing biases that, that still exist. Um, but when I went off to college, even though it was only 45 minutes away, it was a whole different world. It was a Lutheran college, for one, so most of them were either Germanic or Nordic in background. I didn't understand that at 18 years old. All I knew was that everybody was blonde. <laughs> and I thought I knew what the world looked like. I'd been through high school. I'd been around Anglos, as we call them in Texas. I thought half Anglos were were dark-haired, and then there were some that were brown-haired, and then there were a few blondes. Because I grew up in San Antonio, where even the Anglos are mixed with Mexican, you know. So I didn't get it until I went off to a place that was really genetically different, I thought. And I couldn't figure out why there were so many blonde people around. And everybody had blue eyes, like blue, 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 like water, you know. And I would, I would find myself just kind of lost in the first few weeks there. And it took us a while to find each other. There were six Mexican-Americans on campus, okay? It took us a while, but we found each other. And then we stuck together in the cafeteria, in the same table, you know? And when somebody came in to visit, like somebody's cousin came to look for them or somebody, whatever, we'd all say, brown meat, man, brown meat, look. You know, it, it, was, it was a very weird feeling. And I called it Amber Waves of Blonde. But I felt like I was in a, 
a strange country. I felt like I was in a foreign country. That was leaving my comfort zone. And some 30-something years later, when I go to the other side of the world, to New Zealand, to a conference where there's people from India and Japan and Australia and Russia, and I didn't feel as much outside of my comfort zone. Even though we didn't all speak each other's languages, we were speaking with pictures and signs and gestures and things. Um, it's that message that when we find that home is what we carry inside us and differentness is also what we carry inside us. It's at that point that really, we really become citizens of the world, that we really know we can go anywhere, we can, you know, scream at the Russian babushka with the, you know, our, our, our hands on her neck and then kind of relax at the same time and, and be okay. I'm not sure I would have been quite comfortable in that setting with her screaming at everybody that I was an Amerikanska. But, uh, you know, uh, it's that moment, I think, that's really important. So when it, that leaving the comfort zone is really crucial. It has to happen, whether it happens moving 45 minutes away, whether it happens in your own country, whether it happens in your own city, or whether it just happens by just going someplace where it's so, so different that you can't deny that you are out of your nest and far mm -hmm. from your nest. I think that it's a necessary part of mm -hmm. our accepting the rest of the world and therefore accepting ourselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's beautifully summed up. Mm -hmm. at this point, and um, it is a screen night for some people. Thank you.